Okay, everybody, we are back again uh, with biochemistry. This is going to be chapter four, talking about enzymes. So the objectives for today, just explaining the general concepts of enzymes and their general action, describing the roles of cofactors and coenzymes in enzyme-catalyzed reactions, the international classification of enzymes and specific examples, Describe an enzyme-catalyzed reaction in terms of energy utilization for biochemical reactions. List and describe the various catalytic strategies of enzyme action. Describe and explain enzyme kinetics. Uh, when we get to that part about enzyme kinetics, uh, I'm going to go ahead and actually link a couple of short videos in the description below, uh, just because I think that having a little bit of a different walkthrough um, for enzyme kinetics that can be one of the more complicated things to understand um, and I know I have a couple of YouTube videos that uh, I can I can share that uh, does a really good job talking and walking through those enzyme kinetics uh, regulation of enzyme activities by various types of inhibitors and activators or modulators and how they influence enzyme kinetics list some of the common themes encountered in the regulation of metabolic pathways. This right here is what we're going to focus a lot on is the regulation of metabolic pathways. That will be really, really important here moving forward and we'll really want to focus on that. Describe the enzyme regulatory pathways including allosteric enzymes, protein-protein interactions, proteolytic cleavage, and reversible covalent modification. Again, we'll spend a bit of time on that as that can be really important as well. So talking about enzymes, some of the essential general, like, overarching concepts is that enzymes are biological catalysts. So when we look at this biological, meaning that they are natural, they're found in nature, they're made up um, of the, uh, those carbon based, they're, they're proteins um, that we're going to be using, and they are catalysts. So this is a really, really important word and a big definition that we really want to make sure that we know and that we understand. So catalyst, it's, go it's going to be a substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction without itself undergoing any permanent chemical change. So what this is saying is that we're going to have some substance that is going to increase the rate of a chemical reaction. The way that it increases the rate of the chemical reaction is lowering something called the activation energy. Activation energy is how much energy you need to put into um, the system or into whatever is going on in order for it for the reaction to occur. So for example, we have our reactants to our products. In, uh, without a catalyst, we have to have this amount of, fr of energy available in order for the reaction to take place. When you have a catalyst, it lowers the amount of energy that you need. It lowers the activation energy that you need for that reaction to occur to get the products that you're looking for. Um, and through that process, right here it says without itself undergoing any permanent chemical change that means <clears throat> that you're going to whatever react reaction you're going to have you're going to start off with reactants add the catalyst at the other end you have the products plus the catalyst the catalyst doesn't get absorbed into the um, the products itself it's still separate it's still um, se it's still separate from the reaction as a whole from the ex actual end products. That's a really, really important key fat, keynote to make. Um, and really, really remember that, that the catalyst is always going to be there at the end. So if you get given a chemical equation, look to see what is the same at the beginning and the end. More than likely what you're looking at is that that's going to be uh, your catalyst. We mentioned this already, they are proteins in nature with very specific functions. A catalyst is going to perform a very specific function. Um, and just like when, the, when we talk about proteins, proteins, typically their functions are very, very specific. They're built for one purpose and one purpose only. 
and like that's the job that they do. Uh, recently, some RNA molecules are a sequence of nucleotides. We'll get more into what RNA is uh, later on down the road in our biochem adventures. Also have been shown to have catalytic power and are called ribozymes. Uh, we won't mention that a whole lot. Good little definition, though. Uh, throw that in your notes as a definition to, to remember. as because it might pop up, pop up later on. So enzymes are reaction-specific, and they increase rate of biochemical reactions, decrease activation energy, or lower free energy of biochemical reactions. We'll get a little bit more into something that's called Gibbs free energy. Um, Gibbs free energy is, uh, the, the easiest way to think of it right now is that we'll look at the type of reaction that is occurring, whether it is a endothermic or an exothermic. Endothermic meaning that it takes in heat, takes in energy, or exothermic meaning that it gives off heat or gives off energy. Um, and when, kind of what the energy that we're going to have um, around needs to be for those sort of reactions to take place. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, if you want to know more about Gibbs free energy ahead of time, go ahead and Google it. Um, it should be a quick, easy video somewhere talking about Gibbs free energy, just a quick definition for it. However, concentrations in the native nature of the enzymes remain unchanged before and after the completion of reactions. Remember that was the thing that we said? Remember that. Enzymes remain unchanged. The enzymes are specific for their substrates and products. Specific, know that. Specific meaning that the one enzyme is only going to interact with the specific substrates or the um, the specific the, the no, what's the what's a good way? Let's make sure we know a good definition for substrates. It's the underlying substance or layer, the substance on which an enzyme acts. It's going to be like the 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 other stuff that get the stuff that gets acted on. So like you could have um, a protein. Let's say a protein is going to be, or let's say some sort of chemical chemical compound is going to be broken apart to release energy, um, and a an enzyme is going to come and to help facilitate that reaction. ATP could be a good one. ATP, you have what's called ATPase that will break down um, ATP to release energy for us. And so the ATP itself would be our substrate and then the products would later be the ADP and a free uh, phosphorus ion. Okay, so substrates in a specific reaction are actually the reactant molecules participating in a particular reaction. Substrates bind at the specific active substrate binding sites present in the enzyme. But this is saying the enzyme has specific sites, specific spots on it to allow binding to happen to the substrate. Enzyme substrate interactions <coughs> form specific products. Again, we have specific substrates, specific enzymes to get specific products. All biochemical reactions are essentially catalyzed by enzymes, except very few non-enzymatic spontaneous reactions. Spontaneous reactions um, occur just when the when the proper conditions are met, um, and they just they happen kind of randomly. Uh, we'll get into <coughs> a concept that's called entropy. Let me write that down. Uh, entropy, and so we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that kind of that spontaneousness and uh, entropy. You can call it sort of the the chaos of a system. We'll get the kind of the organized chaos. We'll get a little bit more into that um, down the road. Enzymatic reactions are regulated by various factors, included but not limited limited to some of the intermediates in that specific pathway or by metabolites from other pathways from other pathways by by end product by covalent modifications and by some activators or inhibitors so there's a whole lot of different things that can influence our enzyme reactions that can either make them uh, move progress faster that can stop them can just to help to help modulate them because we don't always want reactions to be happening uh, we need there to, there to be a good amount of control within our body, within our system. 
Okay. <clears throat> Many enzymes require chemical groups, group or groups for their activity, such as cofactors and coenzymes. This is one that gets a lot of people mixed up, cofactors versus coenzymes. Um, well, let's look at the definitions down here below. Um, make sure that you really learn how to differentiate these two because it's a lot of easy easy type questions where it'll ask identify the cofactor or identify the coenzyme or which of the following is a cofactor uh, which of the following is a coenzyme which of the following is not a cofactor questions like that um, that if you know the definition of the word should be really really simple to answer um, can get really complicated if you mix those two up so some enzymes require cofactors or coenzymes some en enzymes do not need any chemical groups for activity and some enzymes require both. So talking about cofactors, cofactors are metal ions. Cofactors are metal. So if you think about remember factor equals metal. Uh, if, I don't know if this, this helps thinking about like fear fear factor, that show that was on way long ago. Um, you have to be pretty men metal or mental to do fear factor. So if that helps you remember it, hopefully uh, that gets one or two of you to remember it. Some enzymes need one or more metal ion cofactors for their optimal activity. Some of the examples of cofactors are iron, magnesium, uh, what was MN? Manganese, I think, uh, zinc, etc. Uh, also you can include things here in the metal. Uh, metals thinking like potassium, that sort of stuff. Coenzyme. Coenzyme is going to be our vitamins. They are larger, complex organic molecules or metal metallo organic molecules. So they can can have metal in them, but organic. We talked about what organic means. Remember, organic. We're thinking more that it's going to be containing carbon. So vitamins is when we think about all of our our vitamins, vitamin D, vitamin K, vitamin E, uh, vitamin A, all of those guys. Um, and then obviously there are more B vitamins um, are really, really important for our different chemical reactions. And I'll actually pull up a table. Uh, let me actually do that right now. There is a, a table for... that I have put together. This is this is part of my, my board study and practice um, information that I have. Let me see if I can find, here we go. So our B vitamins, B1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 9, and 12. The little mnemonic to remember this, uh, tall, rich nudists played pickleball for centuries that's the name, thiamine riboflavin, so tall, rich, nice, and nudists. Uh, pantothenic acid, or pantothenate, uh, played pyridoxine pickleball, pickle, biotin ball, folate for cobalamin centuries. Um, each of these have their different active forms. You can see these um, in different, uh, in these different forms, so anytime they're talking about FAD, FAD, the ones that will see a lot of in this course are going to be FAD, the variations of NAD, NADH, NADH, NADP+, NADH, NADPH, nicotinamide, adenine dinucleotide, all of those fun words, they are all saying the same thing. As well as we'll look at um, B9 is one that we, uh, is really important as well that we'll see a lot of. Uh, this is just kind of a fun fact, but MTHFR, also m known as the mother effer, uh, the mother effer gene, or mother effer um, enzyme, uh, co, sorry, <laughs> coenzyme, the MTHFR is actually really, really important um, when it comes to uh, breaking down and like actually using folate um, and folic acid and it's actually in recent population due to a lot of dietary changes in people um, 
genes are actually the MTHFR gene on people's DNA is not being as expressed as much as it once was, um, which is why we see a lot of issues with uh, pregnancy in today's world. So yeah, so we'll, we'll get we'll get more into all of those. I don't know if it's in this chapter, but I would definitely start learning those now. Um, learn that mnemonic, learn the names of them, because those will come up a lot um, throughout your time in school. Um, I think it'll be for sure in um, this class, then again in your clinical nutrition class, a little bit as well in um, pharmacology and toxicology, and I believe also just a little sprinkling here and there in a couple of other courses when we start talking about deficiencies, um, lab diagnose, diagnose, uh, lab diagnosis class as well is another one that'll pop up quite a bit. <clears throat> okay, uh, more terms and definitions. Halo enzyme, uh, aka an active enzyme, an apoenzyme plus a bound coenzyme or cofactor. So just good. I think these should have been different a little bit of order. So the apoenzyme is the inactive protein part of the enzyme, and then once it is bound to a coenzyme or a cofactor, it becomes a halo enzyme. So if you want to write that in your notes, so inactive enzyme, aka an apoenzyme, plus coenzyme or cofactor gives you a halo or a hollow enzyme. <clears throat> okay. Prosthetic group is a, a non-amino a non-amino acid chemical group covalently bound to enzyme. So in a conjugated protein prosthetic group uh, there is a part of the protein that is not composed of amino acids. An example is a carbohydrate moiety attached to a glycoprotein. So here we're getting into a whole bunch of big words that, to be quite frank, I hate remembering all of the definitions for. So let's make sure that we understand each of those words before we move on. So let's say conjugated. So in biology, become temporarily united in order to exchange genetic material. So it's probably more like this definition here. Here we go, biochemistry. A substance formed by the reversal combination of two or more other things. So it's a substance, so a conjugated protein. So you have a non-amino acid chemical group completely bound to an enzyme. So this right here, all of this. Um, is what this is talking about, a conjugated protein. So you have a protein that's made up of a couple different things stuck together. Uh, and just, just to clarify, this a part of the protein that is not composed, a part of the protein that is not composed of amino acids. <coughs> uh, do, 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 do. And then we have a coenzyme. A lot of this is definition type stuff. I would highly recommend um, go through like let's even let's take a moment to do that with you guys. Uh, so a prosthetic group. Let's define that. A non-protein group forming part of or combined with a protein. So let's even just throw that right in here. I don't love how sometimes compli how complicated sometimes these scientists make these definitions. And they're really not. <coughs> They're not meant to be that that confusing. So you have a prosthetic group is a non-protein group forming part of or combined with a protein. So something that is not amino acids, not a protein, like say, say carbohydrate, just like this, that carbohydrate moiety attached to something that is a protein. So non-protein, protein, stick them together. That's your prosthetic group. So the carbohydrate moiety attached to a glycoprotein. The non-protein non combined with the protein. <clears throat> okay, another word, coenzyme bound to 
apoprotein A. Uh-oh. There it goes. Apoprotein, define biochem. An apoprotein, the polypeptide part of a conjugated protein. For example, an apolipoprotein plus a lipid particularly yields a lipoprotein. So the polypeptide part of a conjugated protein. So for example, up here in that prosthetic group, um, coenzyme bound to an apoprotein. So we have the car so again the carbohydrate moiety. Um, and attached to the glycoprotein, the glycoprotein would be considered our apoprotein. Again, definition stuff, just really annoying. Um, just if you take the, t take the time to understand the definitions, everything is a little bit easier to understand. Okay, the coenzymes can be bound to the apoprotein covalently or non-covalently. So remember when we're talking about those um, different types of bonds, um, with the covalent bonds, talking about sharing of electrons and that sort of stuff. So you can either share electrons or not. So coenzymes are going to act in group transfer reactions. Um, we'll get into exactly what kind of what that exactly means, um, and then or they can act as a co-substrate or a second substrate in the reaction. So remember, the coenzymes are being used with our, our enzyme, right? And the enzyme will always start and end the reaction with the same structure slash chemical makeup, right? Our enzyme itself is going to end up the same as it was in the beginning. Coenzymes might end up part of the um, part of the substance being included into um, the product. Okay, so in a typical reaction for group transfer, and when we say group transfer, we're talking about functional groups. Um, so earlier. Let me pull it. I'll just pull up a picture because it's a little bit easier. Earlier in the book, um, we saw all the different functional groups. Stuff like this. An alkane, alkene, alkyne, a benzene ring, a thiol, an ether, an alcohol, a mean, a carboxylic acid, an amide group. All of these guys are our functional groups. So well, essentially what we're doing for this functional group transfer is we're taking a, for example, like a benzene ring, uh, let's do an alcohol. It would take the alcohol off of one substance and give it to another. That's all that we're saying when we're talking about group transfer reactions, okay? So AF, F being that functional group, plus C equals A plus FC, so that the functional group is being transferred from the A to the C. Then the co-substrate or second substrate, we have chemical changes in coenzymes counterbalance those occurring in the substrate. So stuff like oxidation reduction reactions. Remember we talked about oil rig. Oxidation reduction reactions have to do with electrons. Oil oxidation is loss of electrons. Uh, reduction is gain. I spelled that wrong. Reduction is gain of electrons. So one molecule of the substrate is oxidized and one molecule of coenzyme is reduced. So we're moving the electrons off of the substrate to, uh, to that coenzyme. And so we think one of the big coenzymes that we talked about, or that I mentioned briefly that we focus a lot on, is this guy right here. 
our NAD, NADPH, these guys. So you can have a reduced form and an oxidized form, right? So oxidation is uh, loss, um, reduction is gain. Let me find a good. And these these are the kind of questions. It's what you're going to see a lot of. You'll see quite a few of these. Uh, which of the following is the reduced form? Which of the following is the oxidized form of these substrates? So of the of the coenzymes and of the substrates. So remember, reduction is when a molecule gains electrons, such as when NAD NAD plus gains the electrons from a hydride to become NADH. In this case, we say that NAD plus has been reduced to NADH. So NADH is our reduced form of um, our B3. So you could say our B3, our, you could even say which of the following is the redu reduced form of B3. The reduced form of B3 would be our NADH. Oxidation is when a molecule loses electrons such as when NADH loses its hydride to become NAD plus, okay? So then this is our oxidized form, and this is our reduced form. Sorry, give me one second. I got a message from... Those are our oxidation reduction reactions. And so when we, and actually when we'll talk about this a lot, a lot later on, but our B2 riboflavin and our B3 niacin, those active forms, these are the ones that we're really going to talk about being involved heavily in those oxidation reduction reactions. And the, these are really, really important when we get into the, into glycolysis when we get into the Krebs cycle um, and then the genera eventual generation of ATP from the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. Um, that's not for a while before we get into that, but just kind of setting that up for the future, um, knowing that what which one is the oxidized form versus the reduced form, and that they will be very, very important later on. Okay. In transamination reactions, the pyridoxal phosphate, let's see, we have saw that one before, right? Pyridoxine, pyridoxal 5-phosphate, we're talking about B6, transamination, pyridoxal 5-phosphate, acts as a second substrate in two concerted reactions and as a carrier as a carrier of an amino group between two between different alpha keto acids. That's what transamination is. Trans transport amine amino Asian just Asian is what's happening, I guess. I don't know, English is weird. So taking and transferring the amino group between different alpha keto amino acids. Okay. <clears throat> Coenzymes as transient carriers of specific functional groups. So here we go. This is when we really start getting into that. So the, this, this is a lot of, um, <clears throat> this is kind of a lot here. Um, I prefer this chart here. Um, again, like I said, this this will be um, avail available for you guys to to access if you want. 
um, there's a Google form in the description where it'll give you all through this. And this this whole document, this is technically for boards, um, but this is really, really good information, kind of having um, things broken down into kind of the most important, most um, most tested information that you will eventually see on boards. So it's a really good kind of, I, I think it's a really good study tool um, that you can use later on to focus yourself, um, as well as like this information, because you'll start to get into all of these deficiencies, the, the reactions, all that kind of stuff. And again, like I said, the, um, the Google form to be able to look at those and um, to be able to get access to those will be in the description down below. Okay, so we're talking about the, the dietary precursor, precursors. So biotin, pantothenic acid, vitamin B12, riboflavin, niacin, pyridoxine, or vitamin B6, folate, which is our B9, thiamine, and the endogenously producing sulfur-containing fatty acids. I don't remember really talking about that a whole lot. Um, if he mentions it in class, lock onto it, but I would heavily know these guys. Remember our mnemonic, tall, rich, nudists played pickleball for centuries. One, two, three, five, six, seven, nine, and twelve. <clears throat> our cofactors. We have all the whole list. Uh, I wouldn't try to memorize these as much. Um, some that I would remember. Sodium is a good one, potassium, iron, um, magnesium, and zinc are big ones. Um, he, he, you'll probably see a question somewhere that is, uh, which of the following are cofactors, or which is not a cofactor, something like that, is a about as deep as you'll go with these. Occasionally, you'll see if if there's like specific reactions that that get that you ta end up talking about in class. Um, focus on those, um, knowing those because those are the ones that are most likely going to be tested on. Um, don't just try to straight up memorize all of this though. It's just a lot of work. Um, just focus on the ones that get mentioned in class and know what a cofactor is. If you know the definition of a cofactor, you should be able to answer questions like that. Okay. <clears throat> Classification of the enzymes and nomenclature. Nomenclature is just literally the how you name stuff, how you call stuff what it is. So it's based on chemical reaction type, also the reaction mechanism. Enzyme name has two different parts. The first part indicates the substrate, so the stuff that's getting acted on. And the second part indicates the type of reaction catalyzed. And the big clue for your dealing with the enzyme is the ACE at the end. You will probably at some point see a question that says, which of the following is an enzyme? Or it'll say, which of the following is not an enzyme? Look for the ACE. Uh, if, you, if it doesn't end with ACE, it is not an enzyme. <clears throat> so here we have six different classes, oxidoreductases, oxidation reduction, transfer of electrons. So we stop and we think, what's one that we've talked about already that deals with that? Our NADH, right? A, also known as our B3. Uh, also known as our tall, rich nudists, our niacin. Transferases, group transfer, amazing. Transferases, transfer stuff. Transferases, transfer stuff. Hydrolysis, hydrolysis of a substance or breaking of a chemical bond with the use of water. Hydro, hydro is water. Water, remember, just remembering that it is the breaking of a chemical bond with the use of water. Um, you can also. You, you, we've talked about this a little bit before. That is going to be a hydration reaction. Remember we talked about um, the opposite of a hydration reaction 
the op remember the opposite of a hydration reaction is a dehydration, aka condensation, um, is when you form a bond and water comes out. Hydration, a hydrolase takes in water to separate those two things. Lyases, break breaking of various chemical bonds, such as carbon to carbon, carbon to oxygen, carbon to nitrogen, and carbon to sulfur by means of other than hydrolysis and oxidation, often forming or breaking new double bonds or a new ring structure. So this is again, um, breaking chemical bonds by means other than hydrolysis or uh, oxidation. So, because if it's if an oxidation or reduction happens, it would be an oxidoreductase. If it uses water, it would be a hydrolase. So a lyase to lyse something. Come back to root word to lyse something means to break apart or break down. So that's what that is. Just anything that's breaking something apart without using that's not using water or an oxidation reaction. Isomerases. An isomer, so transfer of groups within molecules to form isomeric forms, so to form an isomer. Ligases, ligase, ligand is to bond, to stick together. So it's the formation of the CC, CO, CN, and CS bonds by condensation coupled to cleavage of ATP or similar coenzymes. So these guys are lice, lyases and ligases are opposites of each other. Okay. So a typical example of an enzyme classified by using enzyme commission number. Uh, uh, this is this isn't something that we're gonna go into really during this class. Um, like the EC two point seven point one point one. This is like. Um, classifying the different enzymes, and this isn't something that we go super deep into because this is this is just a little bit kind of memorizey. So don't worry too much about that. I wouldn't spend your time memorizing that. You've got a lot of the better things to do. Okay, now we're gonna get into these actual individual reactions, and I'm actually gonna go ahead. I'm gonna stop this recording and we're gonna go over all of these reactions um, in another video, just to kind of keep this, um, let me just actually see, yeah. Uh, you know what? We'll, we'll, we'll get through these and then we'll, we'll, I'll do another video, um, just to kind of keep this within a good amount of time, not have to kill yourself watching it. Okay, so the oxidoreductase, remember, we're doing with um, oxid, uh, oxidase reactions and reduction reactions. And remember, our we have our oil rig. If you don't remember what that is, go back up. Watch it. Uh, re rewind a little bit. Remember what that is. Oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is gain of electrons. Oxidoreductase class of enzymes catalyze oxidation reduction reactions. In other words, they are involved in transfer of electrons or hydride ions or hydrogen ions. This is all saying the same thing. Okay? So in, in the case of these reactions, this is saying the same thing, that the electrons are equivalent to a hydrogen ion. So that's why when you go from NADH or NAD plus to NADH. You think about it when you join it. The reason why there's no longer a positive charge is because you're gaining electrons to that in that reaction. You all you gain a hydrogen as well as the electrons with the hydrogen. Generally, they are called as oxidase or dehydrogenase or reductase, or monooxygenase, or dioxygenase enzymes. So all of these things, this is another case where you just have, get a lot of AKAs. Where like, There's a little bit of difference with the specifics of these names. However, they're all doing 
the exact same job. So this would be a good time in your notes to write oxidoreductase and write all of these down oxidase, dehydrogenase, reductase, monooxygenase, dioxygenase enzymes. Anything like that that you see is performing the oxidoreductase. So in this typical example here below, there are is ethanol is oxidized to form acetaldehyde. Uh, or yeah. Acetal acetaldehyde. Eh, acetaldehyde is how I've been pronouncing it. NAD plus is used as an oxidizing agent. Another good term word terminology to know. Oxidizing agent which oxidizes ethanol and itself is reduced to form NADH. So that's another way that you could be asked these sort of questions of in the following reaction. Sorry. Give me one one moment. Sorry. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we were looking at the ethanol. Uh, talking about, okay. Talking about. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and end this recording, and uh, I'll start a new one for to continuing uh, this discussion. <laughs>